Hello, hello! Uh, my name is Dane, and today I'm going to be making a start, at least, on my review of Sparkling Cyanide by Agatha Christie. This is a Hercule Poirot novel. As always, I'm going to read the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, six people sit down to a sumptuous meal at a table laid for seven. In front of the empty place is a sprig of rosemary, rosemary for remembrance. A strange sentiment, considering no one's likely to forget the night, exactly a year ago, that Rosemary Barton died at exactly the same table, her beautiful face unrecognisable, convulsed with pain and horror. But then Rosemary had always been memorable. She had the ability to arouse strong passions in most people she met, in one case, strong enough to kill. So I just thought this was interesting, um, this reference to the way that death was handled. Iris had gone up there one day after an unsuccessful hunt for an old red pullover for which he had an affection. George had begged her not to wear mourning for Rosemary. Rosemary had always been opposed to the idea, he said. This, Iris knew, was true. So she acquiesced and continued to wear ordinary clothes, somewhat to the disapproval of Lucilla Drake, who was old-fashioned and liked what she called the decencies to be observed. Mrs Drake herself was still inclined to wear crepe for her husband deceased some twenty-odd years ago. And uh, this is like an interesting little nod to uh, politics as well. It's changed quite a lot. Back in the day, um, there was the Labour Party, the Liberal Party, and then like the Conservatives. And the Liberal Party was like one of the major players. And it's not really the case anymore. But yeah. At 22, Stephen came down from Oxford with a good degree, a reputation as a good and witty speaker, and a knack of writing articles. He had also made some useful friends. Politics were what attracted him. He had learnt to overcome his natural shyness and to cultivate an admirable social manner, modest, friendly, and with that touch of brilliance that led people to say, that young man will go far. Though by, pred though by predilection a liberal, Stephen realised that for the moment at least, the Liberal Party was dead. He joined the ranks of the Labour Party. His name soon became known as that of a coming young man, but the Labour Party did not satisfy Stephen. He found it less open to new ideas, more hidebound by tradition than its great and powerful rival. The Conservatives, on the other hand, were on the lookout for promising young talent. They approved, they approved of Stephen Faraday. He was just the type they wanted. He contested a fairly solid Labour constituency and won it by a very narrow majority. It was with a feeling of triumph that Stephen took his seat in the House of Commons. His career had begun and this was the right career he had chosen. Into this he could put all his ability, all his ambition. He felt in him the ability to govern, and to govern well. He had a talent for handling people, for knowing when to flatter and when to oppose. One day, he swore, he would be in the cabinet. So, um, I thought it, it does actually say, it says on the side of this, Poirot, but it's not, it's a Colonel Race book. Look, it says Poirot on the side, on the spine, but it's Colonel Race. There's no Poirot in this. So that's kind of strange. But anyway, chapter four, we get his introduction here. Puffing at his pipe, Colonel Race looked speculatively at George Barton. He'd known George Barton ever since the latter's boyhood. Barton's uncle had been a country neighbor of the races. There was a difference of over 20 years between the two men. Race was over 60, a tall, erect military figure with sunburnt face, closely cropped iron grey hair and shrewd dark eyes. And we get this conversation between a man and his uh, significant other. Were you ever in love with Rosemary? A momentary pause and then a laugh. So that's it. Yes, Iris, I was a bit in love with Rosemary. She was very lovely, you know. And then one day I was talking to her and I saw you coming down the staircase and in a minute it was all over, blown away. There was nobody but you in the world. That's the cold, sober truth. Don't brood over a thing like that. Even Romeo, you know, had his Rosalind before he was bowled over for good and all by Juliet. Very true. We get this sort of pretty, pretty, pretty racist part here. Um, I mean, I, to be fair, it's like a reflection of the times that Christy was writing in. Um, and this is one of the characters speaking. He says, yes, here they are. Gerald Tollington, Grenadier Guards, and the Honourable Patricia Bryce Woodworth, young engaged couple. I'll bet they didn't see anything but each other. And Mr. Pedro Morales. Nasty bit of goods from Mexico. Even the whites of his eyes are yellow. And Miss Christine Shannon, a gold-digging blonde lovely. I'll bet she didn't see anything. Dumber than you'd believe possible, except where money is concerned. And then they get Giuseppe, the Italian waiter, in, and he's des described as being monkey-like. This bit made me chuckle, because it made me think of Twitter. Uh, I ought to, I'm going to see her, but I'd rather go to the house first when she isn't there. Do you know why, Kemp? I'm sure I couldn't say. Because there's someone there who twitters. Twitters like a little bird. A little bird told me was a saying of my youth. It's very true, Kemp. These twitterers can tell one a lot if one just lets them twitter. Yes, they can also talk a lot of bollocks about what they've had for lunch. I feel like um, here, 
<laughs> Christie's taking a, a bit of a jab at other writers, she says. Now then, funny, don't be like the heroines of third-rate thrillers who start in the very first chapter by having something they can't possibly tell for no real reason except to gum up the hero and make the book spin itself out for another 50,000 words. So overall, as you can probably tell, I did enjoy A Sparkling Cyanide by Agatha Christie. I'm not sure why it says Poirot on the, on the, on the spine of it when it is definitely a uh, Colonel Race novel. In fact, it's race number four, I believe. Um, but I quite like him as a character and actually Poirot does my fruit and so I didn't mind that he wasn't there. Overall, uh, pretty solid four out of five for me and I would recommend it. It's actually, you could read it as a standalone even if you're new to Christie. So if you see it in a charity shop, get it. So there we have it, that's what I made of Sparking Cyanide by Agatha Christie. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Let me, uh, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Uh, hit, the, the, hit, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.